Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, September 9th, 2021. I am Bill Hain of the Chair. Recording Permit in me, progress. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Good evening. Ms. Exton. Here. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Here. Mr. Carden. Here. Ms. Morgan. Yes, here. And Dr. Ampey. Here. At this time, I would like to entertain a motion to enter executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiation with union and or non-union personnel in which if held in open meeting may have a detrimental effect to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted Arlington Education Association, MOA. So moved. Is there second. a second? Thank you. Second. Roll, roll call. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Carden. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Ms. Ampey. Yes. So move. We are now going into executive session. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Exton, I apologize. Yeah. Motion passes. Recording stopped. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, September 9th, 2021. I am Bill Hayner, the chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Mr. Schlickman. Good evening. Ms. Exton. Yes. Dr. Ampey. Yes. Mr. Carden. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Here. Dr. Holman. Here. Dr. McNeil. Present. Mr. Mason. Present. Uh, AEA uh, uh, President Juliana Keyes. Here. And uh, Ms. Elmer. Here. And Ms. Dunn. Here. Thank you. Uh, there is no public comment at this time. At this time, uh, I will entertain a motion to approve the AEA uh, Memorandum of Agreement dated August 2021. Mr. Chairman, I move we uh, approve the uh, MOA and authorize you to sign it. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. Dr. Rampey? Yes. Mr. Carden? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Here. Yes. Ms. Exton? I'll call her again in a moment. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Uh, and I am voting yes. Uh, I think we lost Ms. Uh, Exton. Um, so at this time, uh, wait a minute. Okay, I'll wait. See if we can get her back. Ms. Exton, we just called the roll for the MOA. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It's a unanimous vote. Uh, and I will sign it uh, when I go in tomorrow. Uh, Mr. Schlickman, you had, had requested uh, to make a statement. Yes, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. Here in Arlington, we are striving to create the safest possible environment for our students and staff. I'm grateful to the Arlington Education Association for partnering with Superintendent Holman and the school committee to agree to a vaccine mandate for our educators. Thank you. Data from across the nation demonstrates this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated and the only path out of the current national quagmire of severe illness and death is through widespread vaccination. Our staff recognizes the special obligation we have to our children younger than age 12 who are currently ineligible for the COVID vaccine. Masking, masking is important, but vaccination is the key to suppressing COVID in our schools and community. What about the students who have celebrated their 12th birthday? If I had my way, we would be enacting a requirement for every vaccine eligible student. But the list of required vaccinations is governed by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. The DPH should act now. 
But in the face of state inaction, we need to look to other opportunities to curtail the virus through vaccination. Not all of the school activities pose the same risk of COVID transmission. Students participating in athletic competition are often in close contact with other participants with a respiration rate up to four times that of a student sitting in a classroom. The Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletics Association or the MIAA governs every athletic program in the Commonwealth. There is no right to participate in athletics. In fact, the MIAA has a thicket of eligibility requirements for students and playing a game with an ineligible student is punished with an automatic loss for the team. Sadly, the MIAA hasn't recognized the need to protect the health and safety of student ad athletes by adding a COVID vaccination requirement to the eligibility requirements. Instead of a vaccine mandate or a statement advocating for vaccination, the MIAA website publishes a list of simple steps to take and make part of your everyday routine, including throw away used tissues in the trash and immediately wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Absent MIAA action, I would like us to explore the requirements we can impose on student athletes who compete on school department property. Can we require vaccination of our student athletes? Can we protect our student athletes by requiring visit, visiting teams to provide proof of vaccination before they compete on our campus? Can we require anyone who is not a student or employee to present proof of vaccination as a requirement to enter our buildings? On a personal note, on August 25th, we were in Pennsylvania to celebrate my father's 95th birthday. 14 days earlier, he was contact traced and tested positive for COVID. Aside from a couple of days of feeling crappy, his most pronounced symptom during a 10 day quarantine was boredom. He was fully vaccinated earlier this year and dad's doctor said he is alive today because he was vaccinated. Vaccines work, vaccines save lives. I recognize that as a local board, there are limits to our authority. Those limits, however, should not prevent us from pushing the limits of that envelope. We need to use every ounce of our authority, both legal and moral, to require vaccination and stop the spread of this terrible virus. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other one? Anyone else? Okay, moving on. Summer professional development and opening day report. Dr. Holman. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. McNeil in just a second, and I'll give him a moment to pull his slides up so that he can drive this. We have combined the professional summer professional development report and the opening day report into one presentation. So Dr. McNeil will get us started with some conversation about what professional development work has been happening and curriculum work has been happening over the summer with all of our amazing curriculum leaders. And then I will talk a little bit about some of the admin learning that happened this summer and um, our opening day. So. Thank you, Dr. Holman. I need the right to share my screen. Uh, Liz Diggins, do you have that? I'm trying to find him, hold on. You are all set. You should have the rights now. Rod, is it working? Yep. You should, yep, good. Can everybody see? Yes, I can. Thank you. And I gotta hit the present. Can everybody see now? Yes. Okay. So I will just advance to the, to the next slide. So I'm, as I talk about the summer of professional development that we, um, completed over the summer, I do want to just acknowledge the work from our curriculum leaders, teachers, coaches uh, who participated and led uh, some of this work that took place. Um, it was coming after a long year, uh, as all of you know, that was very challenging. And I just can't be more proud of the, the commitment uh, from the members from the curriculum and instruction department and all teachers who also who participated um, in these workshops. Um, and then as you'll see part of the agenda, uh, Dr. Holman will talk about the August leadership workshop highlights. 
uh, the new teacher orientation and mentor program highlights and the opening day highlights. Um, and then we can open it up for questions. So I'm not gonna go through every bullet on each slide. I'm just gonna highlight one from each slide. Um, one on this particular slide, I'm just very proud of the work that we've done that actually started last year uh, by bringing in um, a consultant to, to look at our early literacy instruction and to look at the assessments that we're utilizing in order to uh, collect data on specific skills that our students in kindergarten, first and second uh, should be getting through their instruction. And then it's also the, the assessment that we've um, updated, which is the Dibbles uh, is, uh, can also be utilized as a dyslexia screener and has been recognized as by the state as a uh, dyslexia screener. So I'm just very proud of the work that we've done there where we've taken it, the work, the, the information from the consultant, um, which was Dr. Melissa Orkin, and we have uh, incorporated that into how we're going to approach early literacy instruction this year. So we've uh, invested uh, a large amount of res financial resources into training and uh, purchasing the materials to support uh, a focus on uh, phonics and phonemic awareness instruction. So we've done work around that, and that um, was a highlight from the summer from this slide. Um, on the next slide, I want to highlight uh, the social studies where we worked to develop the civics action project. This is something that was uh, piloted last year in eighth and 10th grade. And uh, this year, it is a requirement by the state um, to have our eighth and 10th graders uh, develop and uh, create these uh, civics action projects. And the projects, uh, what, they're, what we want students to do is we want them to um, base the projects on their cultural identity and then utilize that as a foundation to um, identify an interest that they have. And then you can oops, partner with uh, different, excuse me, sorry about that, I hit the button partner with various uh, civic organizations within the community to uh, advance those interests. So last year, uh, some of the pilots, part of the pilots, uh, students focused on um, promoting and uh, working with the Human Rights Commission within the Arlington community to talk about the discrepancy between, uh, you know, what, you know, based on gender, what women make and what uh, males make and so they definitely um, partner with that in order to provide workshops where women who identify as female uh, can develop their negotiation skills to work with their employers in order to negotiate higher rates of pay and other uh, benefits that go along with being um, you know, part of their gender and their role that they play in their family. So, uh, these projects are, are very comprehensive and they have uh, been very successful. So we look forward to that, continuing that work this year. Next uh, slide. It's not going, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot where it was. Sorry about that. It's not advancing, my. <laughs> okay, uh, on this slide, I want to highlight the work around the to up the, the work that we're doing to update and, and um, our health curriculum and a human growth and development curriculum. Um, we are doing this through the, we were able to um, apply for and receive the SIMS grant. And so this is going to allow us to work on updating our curriculum at the fourth and fifth grade level in order to be more inclusive and talk about gender identity and it's also looking at the data that we've collected through our um, different uh, data collection tools at the middle school level in order to talk in, in order to address some of the um, data that we've received, which is around the ideation of uh, suicide uh, from our students. So I'm very excited about the work that we're going to do there. And um, we have a team and an action plan that we had to present in order to receive the grant. 
and the grant uh, totals out uh, in excess of $20,000. So we're going to launch that this year. And we uh, this is some of the work that we did over the summer in order to begin that process. So I'm going to pause there and turn it back over to Dr. Holman so she can talk about the August Leadership Workshop. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Uh, we convened our, all of our leaders, all of our administrators, which is inclusive of our principals, assistant principals, central office leaders, special education coordinators, uh, curriculum leaders uh, in two days of August Leadership Workshop work. And there's a bit of a digest of our agenda for the two days included there on the slide, as well as some pictures of our amazing leaders doing some really intensive work. I was extremely impressed by our leaders at the August Leadership Workshop. They did a lot of really deep thinking about, uh, first, in relation to our common text, how we talk about things like equity, how we talk about students, how the way we talk about students and the way we look at data and integrate um, data into our daily practice can either reinforce uh, belief systems about students or challenge those belief systems and help us do better for our kids. And so we really enjoyed the time that we got to spend together. It was very focused time. Uh, there were tasks associated with each of the two days. Um, on day one, it was a task associated with the text that they needed to read. On day two, it was a task that was really meant to accelerate the work of principals towards building out their school improvement plans with their staff, which many of them talked about um, on their opening days with their staff. So we're really looking forward to the work of the year, and we're hoping that the August Leadership Workshop got everyone um, on our leadership teams very excited and motivated and ready to do uh, what it is we need to do for kids this year in alignment with the pandemic recovery plan and all of the work that Dr. McNeil described on the curriculum side of things this summer. So that's just a brief update about the learning that the leadership team was doing this past week. And do you wanna to advance to the next slide? When I hit the, it's not advancing. I don't know if my cursor's in the wrong place. Oh, there it okay. goes. Yeah. Okay, so we also had new teacher orientation um, and it was uh, overlapping with the leadership workshop. So we had some leaders who were stretched in multiple directions, but they did a wonderful job being present for both. Uh, during new teacher orientation, first of all, the, the week of mentor leadership happened ahead of the new teacher orientation day. And our amazing mentor program, which is led by Marie Janiak, um, helped this, the new teachers get oriented to all of our different curricula in the district. And then on new teacher orientation day, the teachers had workshops on um, department specific orientations, culturally responsive teaching, the role of special education, which uh, are what the images that are here on the uh, screen are from, as well as an overview of social and emotional learning work that we've been doing in Arlington Public Schools and an opportunity to hear, of course, over the course of the week about educator evaluation, technology, and human resources. So our new teachers, we had a big group of new teachers. Mr. Spiegel can probably give you the exact number of new teachers, but we had a, a large group of new teachers this year. And we're really excited to welcome all of them into the Arlington Public Schools, and we're glad that they're joining us. And if it will advance, there we go. Um, and then for opening day, we had a very successful opening day on Pierce Field. It was a beautiful day. Uh, Mr. Hanner was able to join us. Um, he, myself, uh, Julie Keys, and Rochelle Rubino, representing the AAA, all had a few remarks for the staff. We had a lovely breakfast for the staff. Uh, we also had department meetings at Arlington High School that morning that went very successfully, as well as some prep and setup time then at teachers' schools on, uh, on the last half of opening day. We also have been welcoming students back with early outreach ahead of opening day. And so you have an image there of our Pierce student visits. They were outside on September 2nd. Um, and they got an opportunity to meet their classroom teachers. We also had teachers doing creative virtual reach out to families, sending letters home to families, and everyone got an opportunity to connect with their teachers ahead of the start of school on opening day. So we have had a really successful launch. It's the end of the first day of school. Um, it, it was really a joy for all of us on the central office team to get out to schools this morning. I had the opportunity to meet a lot of our Arlington students today, and a lot, I saw a lot of smiling eyes 
Um, not a lot of smiling mouths because they all had their masks on and we're doing very well with that, but I got to see a lot of smiling eyes and say hi to a lot of teachers and everyone's spirits were high, even if we were a little bit um, hot and humid today, but we really enjoyed the day and the opening days and we're happy to take uh, any questions that anyone has about summer professional learning or the start of our school year. Any of the members have any questions or statements they'd like to make at this time? Ms. Sexton. I just wanna say thank you, um, especially to Dr. McNeil for the presentation on the summer PD. Um, it's to see it on those slides and to see how much is happening over the summer and how much work is being done and how much teachers um, are investing in our schools in the summer. Um, is really exciting and I'm, I look forward to seeing how it all plays out throughout the school year. But thank you very much for sharing all that. Sure thing. Thank you for, for acknowledging it. I would just add uh, to that opening day, it was just fantastic seeing the staff. I'm, I, when I think about it, I know we have that many people, but to see them all happy, smiling in a beautiful day it reflected it, it was really great. Uh, Dr. Ampey. Thank you. Um, sorry, it started automatically raising my hand on Zoom, which is very strange. Um, it's like it's watching me. Um, so first, thank you so much for all the work that you did over the summer and everything that was needed to get today off to such a successful start. Um, the question I want to ask isn't meant to be a total downer, but my, my, my understanding is there may have been some students who did not receive that early reach out in some schools. And I'm just wondering how is someone, and I don't even know who that person should be, checking whether or not that these reach outs happened and if they didn't, you know, how, how are we going to make sure it happens next year? Um, so that I guess that's my question or comment. Uh, in response to that, I think I would say that what we did try this year was a bit of an experiment. It's not something that we've done in the past. It's also something that took time from the teacher days at the start of the year, which are contractually at least half of them of the two days. And we had an extra day, which was kind of why we were able to do that. But contractually to those two days, half of them are for teacher prep time. Um, and so I think, you know, we, what we want to take away from this is what we learned from it. So I think it would be, you know, if there is feedback on how that went, we're hoping to collect some of that feedback. And if it's something we want to do in future years, then it's something we need to work into the time we have as, um, as a district in those first two days, understanding that we had three days this year because we removed the professional development day from November. Um, and so we would that's time we would need to work in. Uh, whether or not it was successful is something that we can evaluate with some reach out to families and get some feedback on so that we can decide if we want to do it again. Yeah, I, I think that's great. I, my sense is that it was welcomed by the people who got it and but that there are also people who didn't hear anything um, and were or, or very late. And so I guess I just want to be sure that we're being equitable across board. So thank you. All set, Ms. Morgan. Uh, just to follow up on Dr. Ampey's comment, I think that um, maybe it's it's a question too of like, if it's something that we decide to that you decide to prioritize moving forward, you know, I, I think maybe some of it was like communication and not that the reach outs didn't happen. It's just that the notification sometimes um, about the, the open house periods, if it came from the principal, it maybe came late or sort of buried in with a lot of other information. And um, so that, you know, I think those kind that kind of communication should probably come from the principals of the schools and not rely on the teachers individually to email all of their families, although many, most, the vast majority, I'm sure did. So um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think what we always get feedback on is when things look really different at different elementary schools. That's, you know, that's that's like the full gear, like the middle school, you don't, cause it's like, everybody's just grateful that they go for any little period of time. And that's all about how do you not get lost and stuff. But I think what we get feedback on from the elementary schools is if it looks really different at one place than someplace else. We all set? Thank you. Uh, moving on to ESSER 3 plan, Dr. Holman. Give me one moment to share my screen. And I, we're going to start out, myself and our Director of Communications and Grants is going to join me for this presentation. Uh, and she will get us started talking about, and I hope you can now see my slides, talking about our plan for the expenditure of America or the American Rescue Plan ESSER 3 funds. And I will let her explain what that is and what our approach will be. And I will jump in in a little bit. So Ms. Dunn, do you wanna get started? Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, and the, this American Rescue Plan was approved just this spring by the US Congress. Um, it provides additional funding for districts to support the safe reopening of schools. And the purpose of this funding is so that students can be supported in their academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs while schools are reopened safely, safely in the, re in, in the world we now are in, which is in the world where the COVID-19 virus is still among us. Um, and yes, the, Amer the education portion is known as ESSER, uh, which is, you, the, it was spelled out on the first slide. Um, yes, the APS allocation is 1.1 million and it is 2.2 times, our ESSER 3 allocation is 2.2 times our ESSER 2. So in the uh, fact sheet, when they tell you it's about 2.2 times, that's exactly what ours was. Um, and it is over a million dollars, but it is still um, a small addition to our budget if you consider our overall school budget. So I just wanna have people bear that in mind. Um, there, in terms of ESSER 1 for Arlington, that has been spent, ESSER 2 is being spent. And so now we're at the process of applying for ESSER 3, which was approved in this American Rescue Plan. Next slide. So this grant covers um, a fairly long performance period, which is the period during which the funds can be used. So we can use the funds through the summer of 2024, essentially. Um, the allowable costs are about the same as they were uh, with the ESSER 1 and 2. Um, however, there are additional requirements this time um, and as we look at them, we see that the district, Arlington has already posted our district plan for resilient pandemic recovery and reconnection, which is our safe return to in-person instruction plan. We will post a final plan for the use of the ESSER funds. We will, the district will consult with stakeholders um, and we will comply with the other requirements of 20% on mitigation of lost time. And we have a slide on the last item coming up. So, um, so with stakeholder consultation, what we're going to do is create a plan. Um, the stakeholders will work in consultation with the district, of course, to, re to result in a plan that will address the prevention and mitigation of the spread of COVID-19. Um, we will use funds to impact lost instructional time. Um, and the plan will also detail um, how the rest, all the funds will be spent and how we're going to focus and, and support all the students in the ways that is, but the important thing to remember is that in this um, plan, it really does ask us to focus on those students who have been most impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of their um, school experience. This maintenance of equity requirement is a new requirement. This wasn't in the previous ESSER um, uh, grants. 
And when we apply for this grant, we will provide assurances that the district will abide by this requirement. And as I see it, it essentially is a requirement that the district will not impact the students in Arlington's high poverty schools negatively in terms of funding or staffing any more than those students in our other schools if we are faced with reductions in funds or staff based on our school and local, sorry, state and local school funding. So Monotomy, Thompson and Audison have been identified as our highest uh, poverty schools. They are in the highest quartile of the Arlington schools based on the percentage of economically disadvantaged students in all grades as of March. So this is, um, this is just an, a, an assurance that we will maintain when we, um, we have to maintain this assurance in order to use the funds. Okay. Making sure that I'm not muted. Can you all hear me? Yes, okay. Um, so I will talk about what our approach is going to be to thinking about how we want to spend these funds now that we know what our requirements are for expenditure of them. Um, we are required to do community outreach in order to inform planning. And um, I just want to highlight that one of the requirements of ESSER 3 is that we engage in pandemic recovery planning, which we have done. Um, our entire pandemic recovery planning process was designed to be as inclusive as possible. And so we included 98 people from across different stakeholder groups. Um, I've also been doing listening sessions as part of my entry plan process. And some of what I've heard as part of that process has also informed what we're bringing to you tonight. We are working on descriptive flyers and surveys uh, that would be put out to the community as early as tomorrow, but definitely by Monday of next week, um, depending on what some of the feedback and discussion is here tonight. Uh, we would put the flyer and survey out to families so that we could garner more feedback on some of the uh, large initiative options that I'm going to share with you tonight. So we want to also make sure that we get input from the school committee. We've already gotten some level of input from the school committee budget subcommittee, and we have plans to get feedback directly from uh, the special education parent advisory council on these plans as well. So what I'm going to talk about tonight are three initiative options. And these are ideas that we have for ways that we could spend these funds that are in alignment with the different ways we could spend the funds as outlined by the um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education as, and as articulated by the American Rescue Plan. So I'm going to talk through those, but I want to highlight before I do so that they are data informed initiative options. These are coming from things that already exist that we have analyzed over the last several weeks and even over the past several years. So we have looked at the embargo 2021 MCAS results to inform this plan. Um, and our administrators have dug very deeply into some of those results. They are still embargoed, so we can't share them with you tonight. We have to wait until they are public, and that will come with Dr. McNeil's outcomes report later on. Uh, but we've used those. We've used our fall and spring panorama um, surveys from last year. I've used some of what I have heard in listening sessions from families and staff uh, to inform these options. It, we've also referenced the long range budget plan and I'll reference um, how some of these initiative options align with that long range plan tonight too. And we've received a lot of feedback and input from stakeholders on the recovery planning advisory committee um, and some input from Arlington Educators Association who had a forum last year on different ways that uh, the educators in our system think that it's important that we spend some of these additional resources. So those are the things that have informed this. And I just wanted to give a few examples of things that we have heard that have shaped the initiative options that we will put out to the community uh, or tweak based on feedback that we get tonight. Um, some things that I think are worth highlighting from this slide, I won't read the whole thing to you, is that um, our families have requested to the point that the committee made actually a few minutes ago, really consistent instructional and administrative approaches across the town, uh, consistent experiences across the elementary schools, for example. Families have asked for more opportunities to engage as partners with the schools and with educators. Uh, staff and teachers have requested more support and staffing for implementation of interventions, uh, more access for all staff to anti-racism professional development. 
And our pandemic recovery planning team was really also looking for consistency of instructional implementation and the desire for uh, consistent and accessible communication across the schools. So, and there's some data from the panorama surveys up there as well. All of these things are things that have shaped and played a role in the initiative options that we're bringing to you tonight. So we have three of them. Um, initiative option A is really tied to communication with families and with the community and improved outreach. Option B is uh, targeted at supporting and ensuring access to consistent and equitable instruction across the district. And initiative option C is extended learning time and coordinated out of school services. And I'll talk a little bit about what we imagine some of the expenditures could be, but I want to really emphasize here that as I talk through each of these options, these are big ideas that a lot of different smaller actions or expenditure of resources could take place beneath. And what we're trying to do in soliciting feedback on these is get a sense of which of these things, which we all think are very important, which of these things does the community want us to accelerate now? Which of these things does the community want us to prioritize now? And then we can use our ESSER funds and plan for our ESSER funds to enhance our work in, in that area specifically. So for initiative option A, this is uh, targeted at improved communications and outreach to families and the community. The objective of this initiative would be to provide accessible services and information to families, streamline our communication systems, ensure that we can adequately translate and provide interpretation services to families whose first language is not English, and to ensure that all of our uh, families feel welcomed and supported by the schools. So under this particular idea, we can imagine different ways of spending some of these additional resources and our relief funds, we, we have a few ideas of what they could support. They could support, for example, the design and implementation of a family welcome and resource center, additional staff for things like registration, translation. Um, it could involve the streamlining or redesigning of certain services that we have available. Uh, that provide information to our families, like websites, uh, like our communication systems themselves. Uh, and it could provide resources for timely and focused district communication that includes having those resources translated or interpreted as necessary, which is something that we have piloted and tried out as part of our recovery planning process with our live interpretation of the family forums, um, but is something that would require additional resources for us to embed in the organization and continue to do moving forward. Initiative option B is really targeted at core instructional work that is very important and that is work that we are doing anyway, but we are imagining ways that additional resources could help with this. So the objectives of initiative option B would be to uh, use the funds to develop teachers capacity for culturally responsive instruction that effectively differentiates to make sure we have appropriate intervention and coaching supports across all of our schools that are equitably distributed, including our students with IEPs and our English learners, um, to develop a comprehensive professional development plan that allows us to meet the really important learning goals that we have for our students, um, and to have that professional learning plan be really grounded in what teachers tell us they need to learn and want to learn in order to improve their practice. And then also potentially an analysis and improvement of our multi-tiered systems of instructional support, which is just to say an analysis of how we're doing at core one or tier one instruction, what everybody gets, and then what kinds of supports we have available for students and whether or not those are really doing what they need to do to bring students um, who need more support up to grade level. Uh, in, in their different content areas. So different things we're imagining we could use the relief funds for under this particular initiative option would be things like curriculum coaches and interventionists. And I just want to signal that those are things that were part of the five-year budget plan that the school committee has developed um, around closing the achievement gap and improving instruction, professional development for teachers and administrators to support data-informed instructional practice, or additional professional learning, particularly around social and emotional supports, uh, resources for and staffing for student mental health or professional learning on universal design and anti-racist practice. All of those things are also articulated um, as elements of the five-year budget plan and could uh, really help us improve instruction, close opportunity and achievement gaps um, by focusing all of these additional resources on core instructional work. And then initiative option C 
is really focused on extending learning time and coordinating all of our out of school services. And so what this would be really be designed for is to help us think creatively about not just what we do as a school system during the school day, but what we do outside of the school system that allows us to continue to support students uh, in sort of a holistic sense uh, beyond what we do as a part of our core school day. So the objectives for this would be to really take a look at our existing out of school learning time opportunities and any additional supports academically that we provide or social emotionally that we provide students outside of the regular school day. It would be to develop a cohesive and consistent approach to those out of school interventions if we have them or to develop them uh, and or any learning services that we want to provide outside the regular school day. And it would also be a continuation of the expansion of the summer programming that we've done in 2020 and 2021. We used previous relief funds to expand access to our Title I summer programming, for example. And in order to sustain that expanded um, access to our summer programming, we would need to use funds to continue that and build it into what we typically do. So relief funds for this could support some technical assistance to look at our out of school programming and provide us with recommendations. It could provide a coordinator to, to do oversight and design or expansion of those out of school um, programs and, and or additional academic interventions that might take place outside of the regular school day. It could provide for, um, for staffing, for teachers to provide extended learning time. Um, for those students who might demonstrate a need for it, and it could involve the continuation of expanded summer learning, like I just mentioned. So those are three ideas that we we actually, um, as a team, think all of them are important. We want to do all of these things, uh, but what we also need to do is prioritize. Which of these things can we do really effectively right now? Uh, we really think it's important to do uh, one thing really well as opposed to try to do a million things all at once and so our hope would be to gather feedback from the community as to which of these things the community thinks it's most important for us to accelerate now um, and it will also help us sort of think through as we work on a proposed budget for next school year it can help us and the committee think through what it is we want to prioritize as part of our budget planning process for fy23 so here is our timeline for this work um, the deadline for the ESSER 3 application is October 4th, which does not leave us a whole lot more time, but thankfully we've already done a little bit of the work. Everything you see here highlighted in green is work that we have already done or are doing right now, like the presentation to the school committee. And then everything underneath the green are things that will happen over the next several days. So we would put out the survey and the flyer to the community as early as tomorrow, get feedback from the community over the next week, week and a half, and then do a presentation of the feedback to the school committee, along with an initial spending plan on September 23rd, which would allow the school committee to approve our plan for us or free uh, and, and support it uh, well in advance of our October 4th deadline. So that is our timeline. And that is also the end of our presentation. So we will take any questions, comments, or feedback that the committee has at this point. Members, any of you have any questions or comments at this time? Ms. Morgan. Um, I, we, uh, this was sort of socialized earlier at the budget subcommittee um, meeting, which was um, really helpful and we were able to have a pretty um, uh, informal conversation about it. And it was, um, which was helpful actually because uh, we kind of reacted to it in real time, which I think was, was helpful for me. And um, since then I've thought more about it and um, I'm just, I'm grateful for the really clear um, layout of how this is gonna play out and um, what's needed from us. And um, I too wanna do all of the things. So uh, I'm interested to see, you know, what kind of feedback we get from our teachers and from the community and, uh, you know, and go from there. So thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Garden. Thanks. Yes, I was also also on the budget subcommittee, and and uh, this these uh, this presentation has been refined since then, and, and it's a lot of good work has gone into it. So thank you, Dr. Holman, and your team. Um, I just wanted to point out that it, as as Ms. Dunn mentioned, it's only one point two million dollars. It's not it's not a whole lot of funds over over the next couple of years, um, but it is uh, you know an unexpected pot of money that we 
we, we do need to, to direct to one of these places. And, and the administ administrative team has come up with some great ideas and I'm looking forward to hearing um, the community reaction and um, moving forward with one of these items um, in the plan. And, and also, as, as Ms. Morgan mentioned, pursuing the other items uh, to the extent we can through the budget process. Thank you. Dr. Ampey. Thank you. Um, also on budget, and it was nice to see then and now see it again. Um, I had one question about initiative option A, um, one of the sections, which is ensure ability to accurately translate and interpret information for families whose first language is not English. I guess, aren't we already required to do that? Or is our requirement um, I, that one worried me because if we're already required to do that, we shouldn't be saying, ooh, we're going, you know, we are gonna go do this because we should already be doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so, can I speak to that so, a little bit? Yeah, um, I think there is, we have the ability to do this. And there's a difference between some of the tools that we have available to us right now, which does an automatic, for example, um, when we send a message out to families, it does an automatic translation using a essentially Google translator, an automatic translator to translate into all of the different languages our families have identified. And it, that is not perfect. There are better ways to have documents translated um, by a human. Sometimes it's to have it translated and then have a human look at that automatic translation and refine it or, or uh, revise it. And such resources take a lot of money. Um, and, you know, you have to spend for the human eye on certain documents. And for certain things, I think we, we definitely have the capacity to make sure our messages go out and are auto translated by a machine. But sometimes there are things like our recovery plan that we would love to have translated by something better than Google Translate by a human, um, but that we don't necessarily have the resources set aside to have the human translators available to be able to do that for us. Um, also, sometimes we would like to be able to just call a family who we know does not speak English really quickly without needing to schedule an appointment with an outside contractor. We'd love that to be an in the moment thing that we can do. That's a service that certain technologies do provide, but it's an expensive service. It's a service that requires resources. And so, yes, we have the ability to do this and we do do this, um, but we have the ability to do this better and that would require resources. Right. I, I guess what I was trying to say was, I thought, I, I understand we have the ability but also don't we have the requirement or is the requirement not for everything? Um, like I know the handbooks are supposed to be translated and, and notices and, and stuff. So I don't know where our requirement to translate ends and where it became, where we're doing kind of extra. I mean, I, I, I want us to be able to communicate with all our families in the language that they can best understand. And I understand what you're saying about resources. I'm just trying to understand the differences between what we're legally required to do mm -hmm. and then how this is extra. Does that make sense? Yep. We are legally required to translate IEPs. We are legally required to provide interpretive services for IEP meetings. We are legally required to translate the handbooks and team, um, anything else that comes to mind? If a parent requests an uh, interpreter for any services uh, related to their child, we have to provide that as well. Yeah. So, you know, based upon our, uh, when I first came into the district, we had our CPR review, and this is one of the things we were cited on, is that we didn't have a process that was available on our website that staff, and, and families could access. So that was one of the, the things that we have now put in place um, and has been in place uh, since my first year that we were here that I've been in Arlington. So there is a process. So we are legally required to provide a process that families 
um, can utilize in order to request an interpreter or get any type of information uh, translated into their home language. We, we were required to have it in our, the major languages at that time that was spoken in Arlington, which was Spanish, Mandarin, Ch Chinese, and Japanese. And since then, we, we, we've added Portuguese because through the various requests and through this process, we've identified that um, Portuguese is also another major language that we should have um, part of this process. We've also updated our school messenger where um, last year we've added uh, additional languages that includes Russian, um, and I can't think of all the ones off the top of my head, but we've, now we, we have you know, our school messenger that Dr. Holman was referred to that if we put out a message and it has, to, and, and this is the limitation on that, it's, it has to be 5,000 characters or less, um, that can be translated into an array of different languages. I can I can get the specific languages um, and I can provide that for you, but we are legally required to have a process in place that families can access in order to have important information um, translated into their home language and have an interpreter. And we do have that in place in Arlington on our website. Mr. Thelman, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Dr. Ampey, go ahead, finish. I, I guess I would just say, I think you might, when we talk about option A, we want to not just ensure, but enhance our ability to accurately translate. Yep. And that kind of gets at everything we've been discussing. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. Thank you, Mr. Hainer. Um, so thanks very much for this presentation, uh, uh, Julie and uh, Dr. Holman and the team. And, uh, my <clears throat> questions are these. I just want some clarif clarifications. So this is an additional, it's it's $1.1 million over three fiscal years. Is that the idea? And it's, yeah. so it's $375,000 per fiscal year. And this is all, do I, if I think I have that right. Is that all new spending or it, it's, it's going to, it can't cover our existing staff and programming at all. It's gotta be all new staff programs and it's, it's new stuff. Mr. Mason. Um, yeah, I, I was just going to just to make a correction. So the $1.1 million is going to be awarded at, upon application and it can be used by September 2024. It's not like a $300,000 allocation over multiple years. So how we program that, we have the flexibility to do that. So if we need to carry over funds till that point, we can, or you can spend it all at once, but uh, that okay. will depend on our, the program that we pr propose. Okay, good. All right, that, that clarifies. And is this all, so is this kind of all new spending or is it, it, this can't be allocated to any of our existing programming or staff? I mean, it, it can be in that a lot of the programming that we actually talked about here is programming that we have in place and would want to expand or enhance, um, it, even to the point that Dr. Amphi was just making. So it, it would be to enhance our existing programming. It's not, and we can use it to support our what we need to have happen in our budget as well. Like we have been able to use recovery plan to offset um, budget costs yeah. and yeah, but it is meant for pandemic recovery. So a lot of that is newer or acceleration of existing spending. Because I was, I was trying to get a sense of <clears throat> whether or not we, we, we would we would you know do all this new stuff for lack of a as you know as vague of a term as I can for we would do all these new things with this money and then um, including hiring people and then the funding would go away and then what's the plan once the funding goes away? So I mean, are, are would we are we trying to do things that we're going to sustain once the grant goes away? Are we just doing some things with the money we, we, we have for now? And then we know we won't have the money you know, in, by 2024. I'm just kind of wondering what the long-term plan is. Uh, Dr. Holman, yeah. do you want to respond? Or uh, someone? I know this uh, came from the budget subcommittee, so Ms. Morgan, talk. Yeah, this the budget went there real quick, right? As you can imagine. Um, so, and, and we talked about it in the context of some of some of it, you know, 
as soon as we're talking people, right, that that's going to carry on. Some of it could be one-time spending or a one-time investment, but using this to inform how we might prioritize budget spending down the road. Um, but knowing that we have to be very careful when it comes to people, yeah. right? So, and I think that's what makes some of these proposals tricky, right? Is that, you know, buying people or like spending on people when it's not a recurring investment is, is challenging and it's the same, re yeah. So, but this, that definitely came up at budget and um, we, we talked about thinking about it from the standpoint of using it to inform where we would want to invest our um, hard fought for budget dollars down the road. Got it. Okay. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm, I, I, I guess I'm sure there's lots of conversations taking place inside the district uh, about, you know, what to do with the money, how to use it, where it can have the most impact. But if it's if it's only a, it's a short term infusion of cash that we won't get again, um, <clears throat> the best thing sometimes to do is to is to is to is to use it to um, accelerate some things that we're already doing that um, that are that are helping to mitigate some of the learning loss and some of the issues that arose because of the pandemic. That that's what I would say. That you want to kind of jumpstart that stuff, you know, you know, ramp it up. You can kind of use this money to ramp it up faster than you normally might have, and uh, <clears throat> and you know, you have to be careful about adding staff that we might not be able to sustain. But that's always an issue. Any anytime you get a grant, actually, um, you know, that's always a problem. Any grant you get. So okay, oh, go ahead. I would say Start that. The example of exactly what you were just saying, Mr. Thielman, is that we utilize some of the ESSER two dollars to accelerate the expansion of clusters at grade seven, or at learning communities at grade seven. Um, this year, we did that a year ahead of the initial plan because we knew it was coming, but this would allow us to have slightly smaller learning communities at grade seven at the Audison this year. And so we utilize some of those funds to move that forward. Really yeah, quickly. that sounds like a smart yeah. That yeah. sounds like a smart strategy because, I mean, you know, the sentence here, use at least 20% of the funds to address the academic impact of lost instructional time. And I mean, <clears throat> you know, that's a lot of what we're doing. That's everything we're doing this year. And you could argue uh, that outside of social, emotional and extracurriculars, everything that's happening in the classroom is designed to uh, address that concern. Mm -hmm. So, okay, thanks very much, Mr. Hain, appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Sexton. Thank you. Um, thank you for this very comprehensive and detailed plan. I appreciate it. Um, when I think about option B and C, um, the question that comes to mind is, and I think some of this is probably the embargoed MCAS data, but from the, from the administration's perspective, I'm curious, like which of these two sort of have a greater need. And, and some of that will come from the survey data and I'm interested in what the AEA um, feedback is, but I'm, I'm just, I guess I would love to, and maybe this came up at budget, but like I would love a little more meat on, these are the things we're seeing where option B would make more sense, or you know, we have these huge gaps where we want really intensive summer intervention and that's gonna make, or an after school programming that's gonna make a bigger, impact. Um, so you don't have to answer that now, but that that's sort of where I'm thinking about which decision or which option um, sort of would make the most impact from my perspective. I may need to think about that, but I actually would defer to Dr. McNeil because those are really heavily learning specific options B and C um, or even Ms. Keys uh, from the classroom perspective if they wanted to speak to it. Well, I, I, from, from what we're focusing on within the curriculum and instruction department, of course, we want to make sure that we're providing the in-time supports for those students who have experienced learning loss. So that's where the extended programming comes in that Dr. Holman referred to. And we're, we're actually using the model that we utilized last year with the community block grants and we want to replicate that, but extend that uh, so that we are 
able to have more students participate. But we also want to make sure that we're focusing on our tier one instruction, because that to me is going to give us the longevity that we're looking for in order to provide that equity. So when we look at that MTSS framework, we're looking at that tier core instruction. And so we're looking at the various resources we can put in place in order to support that. So that can be in the form of professional development and that can be in the like the additional instructional coaching and then also looking at the, the various assessments we can add at the secondary level to give us the data that we're looking for in order to provide um, an analysis of how we're doing with our and do some progress monitoring with our core instruction. So, I mean, those are things that we've discussed and you know, currently that's where our focus is. If you look at our district goals and things that we're trying to do um, within the curriculum and instruction department. So looking at that core one instruction and seeing where we can uh, supplement at, at the same time, providing that extended day learning um, opportunities for students as well. So it's kind of a both and, I don't know if that makes sense or I'm answering your question, Ms. Sexton. It's helpful. Um... I guess my my feedback would be when when you come back on the 23rd to I'm assuming at that point you'll be sort of presenting a preferred option just sharing um, some of the data that you that you have um, uh, beyond surveys uh, be, to determine which just op, which option um, you're sort of pushing forward. Thank you. We may not be able to provide the any of the MCAS data at that point yet, though. We all set. You know, even if it's if it's you know data from this summer's um, programming or something, but just some context for for one over the other, because I think, like Dr. McNeil just said, like the tier one instruction is everyone, um, and long term would hopefully have. Uh, a really long-term big impact, whereas the summer programming is gonna have a short, you know, steeper curve. And so which decision um, makes sense for, for Arlington? We can, uh, we can also have the, you know, we have our spring data, we have our literacy assessments, we have the iReady data, we have those local assessments that we utilize. So, you know, by triangulating all of those, um, we will have a kind of like we have, and that's what we did during our August, August leadership uh, workshop. Uh, as we looked at that spring data, the things that we have already have completed, and we've utilized that to help us to understand what our instructional goals are that will drive those, um, the, the goals in the school improvement plan. So as, as Dr. Holman stated, it's, we won't have the MCAS data that we can present, but we can definitely analyze it and compare it against that spring data that can help us. So we can give a kind of like an overview of what that, what that is showing us. I don't know if that makes sense, so. Thank you, I'm all set, Mr. Hainer. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Keys, do you wanna say add anything? I don't wanna put you on the spot. No, it's fine. Um, these are all great ideas and I think we'd benefit from any of them. My gut instinct, based on what I've heard from members, is like, go with B, go with B. Um, my concern with C is we had so much trouble staffing our summer programs this year that I'm worried if we put all this money into planning, like after school and summer programs, we're going to run into the same problem of trying to staff them. Um, so, and the first one is stuff I think we need to be doing anyways, but I, I think the anti-racism curriculum is something that we're, we're craving. I sat in a faculty meeting yesterday and saw a graph of an achievement gap again. And we're, we're all like, yes, we know it's there. Help us get rid of it, please. Um, so I think that that's something where I've heard consistently from the faculty. The other thing that came up in our conversations was we've actually made some great strides towards equity through the pandemic by getting hotspots to families so that every kid has high-speed internet at home by getting one-to-one -one Chromebooks so every kid has a device, by even the free lunch, and by making seeing what we can invest in to make those things continue. Because we know the money's gonna run out eventually. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Morgan. And just like one more pitch for that it's, it's really only just over a million dollars. 
right? It's just over a million. And, and I made some like sort of remark in budget that was like, yeah, I mean, I don't even know that people really know what a million dollars is. And then I was like, wait a second, most of them have paid that who've moved here recently for their house. So they might, right? But it is it is a million dollars, which is great. And we're gonna make some good decisions. And I think this is also a good framework for thinking about sort of socializing these sort of initiatives and ideas. And, um, but it's, it's, a, it's one, one million dollars. Thank you. Thank you all. Moving on to uh, superintendent's report, Dr. Holman again. Hold on one second. I have exactly one slide to project and I will be quick with this update. So you have enrollment reports available to you and your materials for tonight, which includes a class size averages update, um, includes an update that we have 209 now, more students than we had in October 1 of 2020. Uh, we have had quite a few new students enroll over the past few weeks, which I am sure you can see because this is a much higher number than the first enrollment report that you received about, I don't know, four weeks ago or so. Um, we've also included a projections analysis uh, against the projections that uh, Mr. Mason had made last year and an analysis of students who have left the district in your materials for tonight. And if you have any questions about those when I'm done with my uh, update, Mr. Mason can certainly speak to those. I've also included in your materials for tonight um, an invitation that we received recently from a group called the Deeper Learning Dozen. I want to provide a little bit. I also gave a memo to you um, a couple of days after we put your materials up in Novus that explains a little bit about what this invitation is. And for the benefit of the community, I'll explain it out loud right now. Uh, the Deeper Learning Dozen is a professional learning organization that is designed to target uh, central office and district administrators and leaders, a group that doesn't typically get a lot of really comprehensive professional learning opportunities. Um, it's an opportunity for three to five district administrators to attend three convenings a year over the course of three years. We go and visit other districts across the United States and Canada and have the opportunity to learn about equity work that those districts are doing in different contexts and with different communities and different community needs. Um, and to sort of learn from those strategies that the districts have used, bring some of those strategies back uh, to the work that we are doing in our own district. All expenses are paid for by the Deeper Learning Dozen. Um, and if we were to expand beyond the three members, we could pay for this through grant initiatives because the work that this organization does is very closely aligned with some of the dis significant disproportionality work we've been doing. This is an organization that's really committed to systems level equity focused leadership development and helping district leaders become better district leaders for equity work. And it's and, and I share it with you tonight because it's an honor to be invited. Um, and it's really kind of an exciting opportunity that we have. It's one that uh, may or may not come back around if we don't take it up. So I wanted to share it with the committee to, to both celebrate it and to uh, gauge support for the opportunity that we might have to send a few of our district administrators to these convenings. Um, I myself would also attend as the superintendent. This is uh, also a development opportunity for superintendents. So, uh, and, and then for school reopening updates, I have a few quick updates to share with everyone. Uh, we did receive word from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that we are required to contact them if we are considering at any point the closure of a classroom grade or school due to COVID-19 outbreaks, we are required to call them and report also any positive COVID-19 cases that we have. Uh, we do have a new dashboard that's live on our website. That dashboard will be updated weekly, um, at least weekly, if not more frequently, but you can count, uh, families can count on it being updated weekly. And we also have a frequently asked questions document that is currently under construction. I apologize that we did not get it up before the first day of school. We are working on gathering all of the questions that we have gotten and providing answers to those. And we will get it up by Monday uh, the 13th at the absolute latest, but my goal is to have it up by tomorrow. And then one small administrative hiring update, uh, Louisa Popkin will join us as our new elementary special education coordinator this year and I believe may have already um, hit the ground running with us. So welcome to Louisa. And with that, I'll take any questions that the committee has about my update.
Anyone on the committee have any questions or comments that they'd like to make? Mr. Schlickman. Not a question, but a comment. I was really impressed with the report of the departing and returning students. It was, it was really great information and I commend uh, your staff for uh, putting that together and sharing that with us. It, uh, it's very infor informative. The credit goes to Mr. Mason for that one. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Dr. Ampey. Thank you. Um, I'm really impressed by the uh, DDD invitation. It sounds like an amazing opportunity. And I'm wondering, do we need to take any action now to, if, if we would like, I don't know if it's the district participating or you participating, you know, I, I don't know who to say, but is there any action that we need to take? Um, and if so, what is that? I, I don't believe so. There is a, an MOA that will come with this, we get MOAs often from professional development providers or from people who we contract to do professional development, just an agreement between two parties. Um, and once that arrives, I'd be happy to share that with the committee um, or with the subcommittee if necessary. I, it is a PD opportunity, so I don't think that you need to take any action. But what I, the, part of the reason why I share it is because it is a significant time commitment of leaders in the system, um, because we do need to attend the convenings. There are three of them. They're about two and a half days each, which means it's about six to, to eight days total of our attention being on this professional learning, those of us who participate. Right now, the team who would participate would be myself, Dr. McNeil. Uh, Margaret Creedle Thomas, our new director of diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, Ms. Elmer here on the call, uh, and we're considering a fifth if we align it with our significant disproportionality work that would likely be a building leader. Uh, Mr. Garden. Thanks. Uh, so in response to what Dr. Allison Ampey just raised, I, I do think that if the MOA, um, MOU, um, requires action beyond just going to the convenings, then that is something that the CIAA subcommittee would want to look at. Um, the initial letter did sort of reference a commitment to develop and implement deeper learning, which of course sounds great. We, we, we do want to do that, but uh, the devil's in the detail. It sort of depends on what, you know, what the MOU says about that, um, you know, giving consent to research in the district or whatever, whatever it is. If, it, if it's just beyond the commitment, you know, on behalf of the staff to attend the, the actual sessions and that, that I do think that's something we would want to look at. And, and I think Dr. Holman is, is, is fine with that. Thank you, Ms. Cotton. Uh, Ms. Morgan. Um, I just hope that, you know, I think that it's obviously a worthwhile thing to do and it's, you know, it, it's professional development, but I wonder if we can't um, figure out a way to fund it, not out of maybe the PD budget so that that money would still, like, I, I just want to, so we could fund it from some other source than straight out of PD. Okay. It would not come out of the PD budget. Thank you. All set. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Holman, you all set on this? All set. Great. Uh, the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the sub of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. <clears throat> Sorry. Approval of warrant number 22042, August 31st, 2021, by $847,269.56. Approval of minutes, school committee meeting, August 24th, 2021. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, this information is not in Novus. I, uh move we table the consent agenda? It wasn't in Novus? It is not in Novus. Any discussion on this? Is that, that's a motion, am I correct? Yeah, a motion to table. Is there a second? Second. Second. Um, discussion. I, my only concern is uh, this warrant has been paid, am I correct? Or does it need our approval to be paid, Mr. M Mr. Mason? The warrant has already been paid. Thank you, okay. Roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Yes. 
Ms. Morgan. Yes. Dr. Mampi. Sorry, what are we voting on? To table the consent agenda because it was not posted in uh, Novus. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Exton. Yes. And I vote yes. Okay, uh, sub subcommittee liaison reports. Uh, budget. Thank you. So we met on uh, the 1st of September on Zoom. We discussed a number of topics. You've heard about some of them this evening. Um, the FY21 and 22 budgets, the FY23 budget process and calendar grants, the SR3, and also a review of student activity accounts for the high school. We've already heard about SR3. Um, you'll find a copy of the budget calendar in Novus. It represents a change of direction in terms of how we've learned of the needs of our school system to change a change that better aligns with the 1993 Education Act requirements. Dr. Holman or Mr. Mason, would you like to speak to um, the calendar at all? Um, I will only speak to it to say that it is aligned with the approach that we want to take to the building and development and sharing of school improvement plans this year with the school committee. Um, and so it is aligned with the a calendar that we had previously discussed in a workshop and then in public meeting relative to presentations to the school committee and that in those presentations of the school improvement plans, the principals will also be sharing what district resources they feel that they need in order to move forward. Um, and that there is also an internal process that is included in that calendar that um, you have that, that is pretty robust and requires us to also have a lot of uh, deep conversations as an internal team as we're developing a proposed budget to, that would go to the school committee. Mr. Mason, if you have anything to add. I think you've touched on most of that is in the main changes in terms of the school improvement plans and then the internal um, deadlines and milestones, which are highlighted in blue. Uh, there's nothing else to add for me. Dr. Rampy. So at this point, we didn't think that we need to actually approve the budget calendar. I know that we have done this in the past, but we don't, we think that basically it can come from Dr. Holman, or Holman and it's just, it is. So you're being given it. I'm not making a motion to approve it because we don't think we need to. Um, but I do have a request on this topic for as for the committee as a whole. At our next budget subcommittee meeting, we're going to be start discussing about how we plan to seek feedback from the public on during the budget process. My question for all of you is going to be to let me know what kind of feedback would be the most helpful to you during the budget process. During the process, I'm going to send out an email or have, have an email sent out for me. And then I'm going to ask Ms. Diggins to compile the individual responses for us to have um, at our next budget subcommittee meeting, which I'm hoping will happen before our next school committee meeting. Um, the grants will be discussed at our next school committee meeting. And then our final topic that we discussed was the student activity accounts. In Novus, you'll find a motion that we made to forward to the full school committee to recommend that you approve the attached list of active clubs and organizations to use the AHS student activity account. So the background for this motion is that we are required to do this annually. We have not been. We need to do it as a housekeeping measure the list has already been called of inactive groups by Mr. Mason. We do plan to do further evaluation of the entire list. Um, for example, why are there uh, graduation groups that have already graduated um, there? But in the meantime, we wanted to approve the list so that we've done what we're required to by uh, Massachusetts general law. So, um, with that, I would like to move that motion that we approve the attached list of active clubs and organizations to use the AHS student activity account. Is there a second? Second. Sure. Roll call vote, Dr. Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. 
Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Ms. Hexton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. And I vote yes. Unanimous vote. Anything else? That's all. No, nope. we'll be meeting sometime soon, but we don't have it set up yet. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Recognizing that we don't need to approve the uh, budget calendar, uh, just as a housekeeping measure, I'd like to move receipt. Is there a second? Second. Oh, uh, any discussion? Roll call. Uh, Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Ampey? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. And I vote yes, unanimous. Budget subcommittee. I'm sorry, uh, community relations, Ms. Exton. Sure, thank you. Um, so over the last few weeks, I've heard um, both formally and informally uh, concerns again about spaces at after school. And I know that this is something that the community relations subcommittee had sort of looked into a few years ago. Um, so I would like uh, this fall to have the community relations subcommittee um, sort of try to reconvene some of those or all of the directors and just make sure that we're still on um, the same page that they were on prior to COVID. I think COVID um, opened up a lot of spaces and now the families have um, are working and in full-time school again, we're seeing the challenges around space again. Um, so I guess Mr. Thielman and Mr. Cardin, I just wanna give you a heads up that that's something that I'd uh, like us to look into this fall. Yeah, do you have a data for any, for any meetings concerning that at this yeah. time? Not yet. It's going to okay. take some work to gather all those after school directors. I recognize that. Great. Thank you. Uh, community instruction, excuse me, curriculum instruction, assessment, and accountability, Mr. Cardin. Uh, yes, we're on hold for now. We'll let the um, year get started and then we'll start our work um, probably next month. Thank you. Thank you. Facilities, Mr. Thielman. We're, so, we're going to follow the same course as Mr. Cardin. We're going to wait. Let the year get started. We do have things to talk about. Like uh, we have one, one of our goals is the uh, inside. Let's we'll talk about the inside and in, working with inside onside for the middle school and other things. So. Okay. I went quite quick, Mr. Cardin. Did I shut you off too quick? No, I had a request for the facilities subcommittee. Oh, okay. okay, go for it. I think yeah. Jane has the same one. Uh, so, so, Mr. Thielman, there was a recent safety audit of playgrounds in town. That resulted in the closure or demolition of, of some of the playgrounds adjacent to some of our schools or part of our, some of our schools. Um, mm -hmm. So it would be useful to get a report on what happened, um, what is the plan to repair or replace, um, why it suddenly happened so suddenly <laughs> right before school started um, and all that uh, because there, there's been some community discussion mm -hmm. of that. All right, is that so what you had, Jane? Uh, can I speak, Mr. Hayner? Sorry. Go right ahead. Yeah, basically variation on the same theme, which was I did pull our policy that like we've got to ensure that we have. It's tricky, right? Because some of it's a lot of it's town property, and they're doing their thing, which is cool, um, and we acknowledge that. And I don't, I don't in in suggesting that facilities look at this. And I did actually look it up today. I am not on this facilities subcommittee. I would have offered to do more of the work if I was, but I'm not. So. Um, I believe it is Mr. Thielman, Dr. Allison Ampey, and Ms. Exton. Um, but I would I would actually like to attend when you do um, meet because I recognize the complexity of this, that it's town property, and that's always been a nuance that has been a challenge for us. But you know, these are playgrounds we use for our programming. Um, and there are a significant number of them that have been decommissioned um, for various reasons that I sure are all very appropriate. So, um, and then when we meet, we can also celebrate the opening of the new Hardy playground, which is incredibly beautiful. And I had somebody send me a bunch of photos from today with kids playing on it. And I couldn't believe that that was at Hardy, to be honest. Um, they finally have kind of a field, which is very, very cool over there in East Arlington. So good news from facilities. But yeah, I, I think we got to figure okay. out what's going on with the playgrounds. Thank you, Mr. Thielman. Okay, so I'll be in touch with Dr. Holman. We'll schedule something in the next, by the, before the meeting on the uh, uh, two weeks from today. 
Great, thank you. Policies and procedures, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, we do have a bunch of things we need to talk about. If there's, and I'll be looking to schedule a meeting uh, pretty quickly. If there's stuff that you think we need to be talking about, uh, you know, I'm addressing this to all the members, please uh, send me an email with the things that you think are at the top of our list. I have my own list and we'll try to work through it. Okay, uh, Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thaleman. The committee meets on Tuesday the 14th. We didn't meet this week because of the uh, Jewish holiday. And uh, so we meet next week and we'll have a report. I mean, the, the project is going along well. Um, most of you have had a chance to see it. Uh, and we also, I think we've heard it last time, the select members, members of the select board, others, other leaders had a chance to see the building as well. Thank you. Liaison reports. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Ampey. I just wanted to add that um, we should be, we're figuring out how to make sure that the community is aware of this, but that because of problems that have come up during the construction process, although we will be able to move into the new building in the classrooms in February after the February vacation, the auditorium is on a slightly delayed course and won't be ready to use until April. Um, and that was, they did a lot of schedule tweaking and made a whole lot of effort to make sure that the classrooms are ready, but something had to give and it was the auditorium that, that gave. So that's all. Thank you. Liaison reports. Any announcements at this time? Any future agenda items members would like to add? Seeing none of the above. Thank you all and be safe. We need a motion to motion adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Right. Someday I'm gonna get one meeting all the way through this. So I will moved. entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Nobody, everybody wants to stay here tonight. Dr. Rampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Mm, yeah. Well, okay, sure. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Sexton. Yes. And I vote yes. Now, good night, everyone. Be safe. Good night.